All right, y'all ready to talk about World War II? Let's talk about World War II. So first, we got to get who's on what side, right? So we have the Axis and the Allied Powers in World War II. Now, the Allied Powers are going to look a whole heck of a lot like the Allied Powers in World War I. We got Great Britain, we got France, we got Russia. Now they're going by USSR. We're going to kind of use the terms interchangeably. I'll talk to you a little bit about the difference between Russia, USSR, Soviet Union, all that fun stuff. Um, but for now, just it's the same thing. OK, it's for our purposes. We don't need to get too far into it. Um, we're also going to have the United States. Once again, the United States is going to come in late because that's kind of our thing in world wars. We're going to be like, no, guys. We don't want to have anything to do with it. Not our business. Later on, we'll swoop in near the very end and claim a lot of the victory. All right. The Axis powers. These guys are really interesting because the thing that unifies them is that they are fascists. All right, so remember I told you guys before, fascism, communism, socialism, any of those isms that aren't capitalism, we don't like them. That's one of the reasons that we don't like the Axis powers. They're fascists. Now, something for you to understand, fascism is different than communism, socialism, all of those isms. They all have very different definitions. But we have a tendency, especially now, especially today, to conflate them. A lot of people, when we are in class talking about Nazi Germany, for example, are going to say that the Nazis were communists. They weren't. A lot of them are going to say they were socialists. Now, the Nazis were technically the National Socialist Party, but by the time Hitler got a hold of them and took over Germany, they were fascists. Okay, so all these guys are kind of unified together under the fascist ideals of the military kind of running the state. All right, so we got Italy, Mussolini's in charge, we got Hitler in charge of Germany, and we have um, this dude named Hideki Tojo in charge of Japan. All right, so let's talk a little bit about our Axis leaders. Now remember, all of these guys are fascist leaders, and what that means is that they have pretty much complete control in their countries, right? So we've got Hitler. Hitler's the one that most people know about. Um, he's in charge of Germany, but fun fact, he's actually from Austria. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about him, um, kind of more in depth in just a second, just because Hitler is kind of such a central figure to the Holocaust and World War II. We've also, though, got this dude, Mussolini, Mussolini is Hitler's Italian counterpart. Um, so these guys are going to unify together. Um, Hitler's going to be responsible for a lot of the fighting that's happening in Europe, and Mussolini is actually going to try to fight in the Mediterranean, um, North African kind of region. And then we've also got this guy. His name is Hideki Tojo. Um, Tojo is really interesting because he is the military leader of Japan, but he's not actually the guy who is emperor. There's another guy. The emperor's name is Hirohito. But Hirohito is kind of a figurehead, you guys. He has power kind of in name only, and it's to do it's to dojo, Tojo, who's calling the shots. All right, so these are our guys that we are fighting against. So one of the biggest questions that I get from students about Hitler in particular is how? Like, how on earth did he get away with all the stuff that he did? How did he get so much power? How did the Jews not know what was happening? How did the people in Germany let him do all of the things that he did? And there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one of the first big reasons is that his rise to power happened over time and it was kind of a slow progression. 
And so he gained more and more power without people really realizing what was happening. The other big reason, though, is that Hitler was pretty constantly underestimated. Um, and I say that because he, if you look at him over here with his little short shorts and his bunny ears and everything, he was kind of a dork, you guys. He was, he was kind of a goober. And so people looked at him and they didn't really take him seriously. They didn't take him as a threat. Um, he was also kind of likable. Um, and in hindsight, we look at him and we're like, no, he was this plotting, maniacal, evil guy. But people at the time saw him as kind of a nice dude, a little bit dorky. Um, he definitely wasn't considered handsome for his time. And he was also pretty well loved by a lot of people, you guys. And it's, it's because he wasn't that diabolical mastermind all the time. He was a great orator, meaning he was a great speaker, and he was pretty personable. People liked him. And so they underestimated, one, his propensity to do evil, and two, they underestimated his ability to do it. Um, and all of this starts way back before World War I when Hitler wanted to go to art school. If you guys have ever heard anybody be like, World War II was actually started because Hitler didn't get into art school. Um, it's kind of true. Um, I mean, not 100%, but kind of. And the reason for that is Hitler was Austrian and he applied to go to art school. He was rejected. And one of the reasons that you could give for not joining the military when there was a draft is if you were a college student. Well, since he was rejected from art school, he wasn't a student. So he ended up in the military during World War One, where he was trained in the art of something called propaganda. We've talked about that before, right? So he was trained in propaganda and he's actually going to use that later on when he becomes Fuhrer. Um, so his rise to power, like I said, it happens kind of slowly over time. Um, he starts out with there's this thing called the beer hall pushed and it's his first bid for power um, and it fails pretty spectacularly. He actually goes to jail. Um, that's when he's going to write Mein Kampf. If you guys have ever heard of that, his little like manifesto. Um, but he is unsuccessful. And then he comes back from being in jail and all that. And he rises to power in the Nazi party um, and he becomes chancellor, um, which isn't the guy in charge. He's just kind of high up in the Nazi government. Well, then he's actually going to say, well, you know what? That's not good enough. And he declares himself Fuhrer. He actually takes over the government, deposes the dude who is in charge and says, hey, I'm starting the Third Reich. I'm Fuhrer. I'm in charge now. What are you going to do about it? And everybody had underestimated him for so long that he had, he'd put things in place and it just it happened. And from that point on, he is going to start pretty immediately ignoring the war guilt clause. Now, remember, I told you guys this is going to come back and this is going to bite Europe in the butt. OK, the allies, it's it's not going to go well for them because they did everything in their power after World War One to punish Germany. But how is Germany going to see that? How are the German citizens going to see that? A lot of them are being punished for something that they weren't even necessarily alive for, you guys. And so they are angry. Understandably, their country is in shambles because of World War I. And they weren't even the dudes that started it. So Hitler is going to do a few things. Um, one of the first things he's going to start doing is something called scapegoating. He's going to start to use Jews as the target for people's anger because we always, always, always like to have someone to direct our anger toward. It happens at the end of World War I. You remember when we talked about the race riots, Red Summer, all that, and people were angry and they were tense and they were scared and they needed somebody to direct all that frustration towards. And so you see lots of race riots. You see it racially directed. Similar thing here. It's going to be racially directed. It's just racially directed towards Jews. And Jews have a long history of being persecuted. Um, they were pretty um, 
pretty hated in a lot of places in Europe and even in the United States. Remember, um, we talked about Charles Coughlin, um, the guy who was talking about Jews and um, anti-Semitic rhetoric and then fascist rhetoric on the radio. Um, he was preaching anti-Jewish sentiment. And so it happens all throughout history. The Crusades, um, which was between the Christians and Muslims for the Holy Land, uh, specifically Jerusalem, um, during the Crusades, there were actually a lot of what are called pogroms, which were kind of like mini holocausts where the Christians would go and just like burn down an entire town of Jews. Um, if you've ever read any Shakespeare, the Merchant of Venice, um, one of the big kind of villainous dudes in that is a Jewish, um, more or less loan shark. He's called a usurer. So there's a long history of hating Jews. And so it wasn't a surprise to target them, right? And people already had feelings about them, hatred for them. And so it was really easy to get them to blame World War I and all of the bad things that were happening on Jews. He's also going to use something called Gleichschaltung, all right? I have no idea if I'm saying that right, but I said it and you don't know German, maybe, possibly, so it's fine. Um, but essentially what this means is it's a media co-opt, all right? So... When you're trying to remember all of these different terms, um, Gleichschaltung has this at the end, tongue. I remember Gleichschaltung is media because the media is talking. All right. So if that helps, good. If it doesn't, I don't want to help you anyways. So this media co-op, though, is basically Hitler being like, hey, the media, unless they're my news media, they're not telling you the truth. They're lying. We talked before about propaganda, right? You guys looked at some World War I propaganda and we talked about the concept of fake news and compared it to that propaganda. This is really comparable to that idea as well. Hitler, for want of a better phrase, was saying that any news that he didn't approve of was fake news. And so that squashed anybody who was saying anything negative about him. So he's scapegoating, he's got control of the media, he's going to start secretly rearming the military, he's going to start taking over a bunch of different places called annexation, and he's going to have a bunch of emergency laws. Now, the closest thing to emergency laws that we really see in the United States um, are executive orders. Now, they're not exactly the same. Um, executive orders are issued by the president. Um, they were, for example, there was an executive order towards the beginning of Trump's presidency um, that a lot of people refer to as the Muslim ban. Um, you might remember that one. And so the Supreme Court overturned that executive order. That's how a functional democracy works. You have a guy who can do something like issue an executive order, and then you have Congress or you have the Supreme Court who can say, no, you don't and overturn something that isn't necessarily legal um, or that isn't necessarily what's best for the country or whatever, right? But if you have these emergency laws in Germany, they're not exactly the same thing. Hitler issued them and there was really nothing that could be done about it. Um, and he does that to shore up his power and to persecute Jews. Um, some of these executive or not executive orders, some of these emergency laws um, are gonna do things like take property and money away from Jews. All right, so this is a map of Germany and some of the surrounding areas. So Hitler is here in Nazi Germany, chilling, um, and he is first going to go in to Austria. Remember, Austria used to be Austria-Hungary, and Austria-Hungary dissolved and Austrians are predominantly of German descent. So he goes in and he's like, hey, would you like to be a part of Germany? And Austria's like, cool, because again, most of them are Germans. So nobody really does anything about that, right? The American government, um, Britain, France, were just kind of like, okay, it's been a while, let, let them have that. 
Well, Hitler is also going to send troops into the Rhineland. Um, remember when we talked about World War One, Germany and France were touching, and clearly Germany could not be allowed to to, to touch France after World War One. So they they take this little area, um, and so it actually used to be a part of. Germany. So we don't really say anything about that. Um, the Sudetenland. We're also going to see troops going into the Sudetenland. Again, this is um, questionably German land anyways. Um, so nobody's really going to do anything about it for a while. It's not going to be until Hitler tries to go into Poland and he's actually going to be friends with Stalin and Russia for a little while, we'll talk about that in a minute, um, to take over Poland, people start to be like, oh no, things are getting out of hand. So all of this annexing territory is happening through a process called Blitzkrieg. Um, Blitzkrieg translates into lightning war. Um, so what it does is it creates disorganization and it relies on speed and stealth to bring about a swift victory. So basically they just go in, attack really, really fast and rely on the idea that people are going to be so confused that Germany will win. Um, so Blitz, um, is an easy way to remember Blitzkrieg. Um, so I don't really football. Um, but I have been told by previous students that there's something involving a blitz in football that will make this make sense to you. So if you know about football and you know what a blitz is, that might help you. Um, I'm a dork, so I associate it with uh, Final Fantasy X and Blitzball. Blitzball was my favorite, um, but Blitzball was all about moving real fast, so Lightning War. Well, after a while, we start to realize, holy crap, Hitler is doing the absolute most, and we should probably address that. Now, by we, I mean the Allied powers, except for the United States, because we're still not going to be really involved in much of anything. So we're talking mostly about Europe here. So they're going to hold a conference because one thing that people in power love to do is hold meetings you guys, like it's their absolute favorite. Like we rename it conference, but it's a meeting. Uh, they do the same thing uh, going into the American Revolution. We call them Congresses. We have the First and Second Continental Congress, Stamp Act Congress. Um, we just have a bunch of meetings. When things are going wrong, we try to figure everything out. It's usually meetings that could have been an email, but in their defense, there's no email yet. I don't know what our defense is now, but so they have this meeting and it's a response to Hitler's demands. And what they do is they promise to give him the Sudetenland, um, one of those places from that map before, um, if he promised to stop taking over territories. They're just they're basically saying, OK, you can have what you want. Just chill out and stop taking other stuff. It's a policy that we call appeasement. It's the idea of giving in to Hitler in the hopes that it would satisfy him and prevent future land grabs. Um, I've actually seen a political cartoon that was pretty cool, had to do with the concept of appeasement, and it's Hitler, but he's a little baby in a stroller, and there's a nanny coming in. The nanny is Europe, and they're trying to give him a bottle so that he'll go back to sleep and sneak out of the room. If any of you are parents, you understand where the political cartoon nanny is coming from. Um, but that's kind of the idea. Just give him a bottle, shut him up, right? And so he agrees to it, but he's Hitler, so he just kind of does what he wants instead. And so after the Munich conference, he is going to sign something called the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. Um, the Nazis are the Germans, the Soviets are Russia. So Russia, who is run at this point by a dude named Joseph Stalin, and Germany, led by Adolf Hitler, are going to agree to annex and split Poland. So they're going to go, they're going to take Poland over, and they agree that they're going to split it. 
Now, this might be a little bit confusing because I told you guys at the beginning of this lecture that Russia is on the Allied side. Now, we haven't actually even gotten to, I know you've been listening to me for a while, so you feel like we should have, but we haven't even gotten to World War II yet. This is all the stuff that's happening in the lead up to it. And so for a while, it looks like Russia is going to be on Germany's side, but they end up switching. One of the reasons is because Hitler doesn't even keep his word on this non-aggression pact. He agrees that he's going to split Poland with Stalin, and um, he doesn't. Not halfsies, at least. So Russia's not going to be terribly happy about that. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the battles that are going to happen in the European theater. So first of all, we're going to kind of split up World War II into the European theater and the Holocaust and the Pacific theater. It's important for you to understand all of these things are happening kind of simultaneously, um, but we're going to look at it in two different chunks just to make it kind of easier to follow and understand. So we're going to look at it in different parts of the world, essentially. So first thing we need to talk about is what happens in France. So France is very bad at world wars, you guys. They are absolutely terrible. And so you remember in World War I, they were basically ditches. Well, World War II, Hitler is going to use that tactic of Blitzkrieg to pretty quickly take out France. And it's interesting because for a while, it's actually gonna look like France switched sides really what happens is um, the Nazis come into France and they take over and they set up what's called a puppet government. Um, a puppet government is where you have people that it, it appears to be led by France, but it's not. Um, so Germany does that and then they're going to do two pretty major things. Um, now we're just looking at huge things that happen in World War II. And we're not going to look at these battles really in depth. Um, this isn't a military history class, and this is more on the world history side anyways. The really significant part of World War II for us, there's two things. One is the Holocaust, because that has implications for the entire world. Um, and the other is really what happens in the Pacific uh, because that's where we're the most active. So we're going to look at some of these battles, but we're not going to go too in depth, okay? Um, so Germany is going to engage in the Battle of Britain and in Operation Barbarossa. These are two huge things. The Battle of Britain is going to be fought by the air. Um, it is Germany's attempts to take Britain over by air because they can't use Blitzkrieg. They can't just pop in, hey, we're here, we're taking over because Britain is an island. So they're going to continuously bomb Britain. Um, if you've ever seen The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Chronicles of Narnia movie, um, there's a lot of bombing at the beginning. That's how the children end up um, at their weird uncles where they find Narnia. Um, that bombing is happening during the Battle of Britain. Um, now it's obviously unsuccessful. Um, so is Operation Barbarossa. Operation Barbarossa isn't a single battle, it's a bunch of battles, and it's Germany's attempts to take over Russia. Um, so a couple big ones are Stalingrad, Leningrad. Um, both of these have a huge impact on World War II, and especially on Russia. Um, now, the Russian response, um, Joseph Stalin's response specifically, is something called the scorched earth policy. It is very effective, if you don't care about people at all. And Stalin didn't really care about his people. Um, what would happen is if the Germans came and tried to take something over and it looked like they might be able to, the Russians would literally just burn the entire town down. So like if you've ever heard of Sherman's March where um, William T. Sherman just kind of burned down Atlanta and a bunch of places in Georgia. Um, it's kind of that, but in reverse, because it was the Russians burning their own stuff down. Um, they would kill the livestock, they would burn fields, they would leave people there to starve to death 
um, so that the Germans couldn't get the weapons or the food or anything that was there. They couldn't use it for themselves. Um, now, both of those are Germany, and I told you guys most of what Italy is going to be doing is in the kind of Mediterranean region. Um, so one of the biggest things that Mussolini was in charge of was the North African campaign, where he attempted to attack Britain in Egypt, and he was going to keep them out of Italy and out of the southern European region. Um, it fails. He fails. Um, Hitler is not happy with it. Um, the U.S. operation called Torch allows the invasion of Sicily, which is part of Italy, in 1943. And Allied troops come up into Italy. Mussolini is actually overthrown. Um, and that's where it gets really interesting um, because Italy is actually going to switch sides. Italy switches sides in World War I and World War II. Um, after Mussolini is deposed, they're going to kind of be like, hey, we're sorry. We didn't mean this whole World War thing. We would like to be on the side of the allies now. Um, one reason for this is by this point in time, uh, not only have they been living under this fascist dictator, but they've also realized what Hitler has in store as far as the Holocaust. And so they're like, no, thank you. The biggest one that the United States is involved in, though, is something called D-Day. D-Day is the one that most people have probably heard of. Um, this is part of a larger operation called Operation Overlord, um, which is the liberation of France. Because remember, France was being run by Germany, the puppet government, right? So we got to free them so that they can help us win World War II. Um, United States is going to play a huge role in it. If you have ever played Call of Duty World War II, um, it is it is predominantly like I think you actually start with D-Day, if I remember right, um, and you go through the liberation of France. Um, surprisingly accurate. Um, and so what ends up happening with D-Day, Allied troops, um, so not just the United States, Britain, um, all those guys, um, commanded by Dwight D. Eisenhower, who is later going to be president. Uh, they're going to land on the beaches of Normandy. Um, they do that in June. And by France, by France, by July, they're going to occupy France. Um, so they'll, they'll be successful in liberating France. One of the really interesting aspects, I think, of the whole D-Day thing is um, Hitler and his role in it. All right, so some of you guys may have heard um, this idea that Hitler had a micro penis. All right, so we're, yes, we're going to go here. We're going to talk about this. All right, so a lot of this is very unconfirmed. It's speculation, but honestly, that's what a lot of historical research is. Um, so, Here's how the story goes. Here's the, the theory. So Hitler supposedly had this rare condition. Um, it's called hypospadius, hypospadius. I, I'm not a doctor. I don't know how to say it. But what this does um, is it makes the urethra, that's where you pee, guys, um, it, it opens on the underside of the penis. And one of the kind of side effects that you see from that particular disorder a lot of the time is uh, a micro penis. And sometimes you also see the uh, fusing of the testicle to the leg. Um, so no fun, not something that none of those are things that you want, right? Um, there's also rumors that during World War I, um, Hitler was, he was injured. He was injured in a battle called the Battle of the Somme. Um, now most reports say that he was injured in the thigh, but some people say that he lost a testicle there. Um, all I can tell you is Hitler definitely, definitely used a lot of medications that didn't necessarily work and would be considered illegal narcotics today. Specifically, one of the treatments for hypospadias um, was the use of amphetamines. So some of you might have heard of something called methamphetamine. 
which is more commonly just called meth, right? Um, so he was he was prescribed a drug because remember this was the 30s and the 40s we weren't too too terribly great at medicine yet um we just talked about the 20s and how a lot of the time you had like cocaine and alcohol being prescribed so he was prescribed amphetamines for one of the disorders that he had um, a lot of people think that it was the hypospadias um, I guess because that was a typical treatment for it. Um, but so anyways, the the story goes, he's on all of these amphetamines. And I don't know if you guys know anything about meth. I mean, like, honestly, hopefully you don't know that much about it. Um, but it causes you to get kind of hyper focused and you get a lot of energy. Um, but then when you come down off of it, you crash. Um, and a lot of people will like sleep for days. And so this is something that Hitler was relatively well known for, um, not necessarily the use of the amphetamines, um, but the fact that he he did have the proclivity for staying up for a really long time and then he would crash and he would sleep for a really long time. He would sleep really late. He was also super, super controlling. All right. So the medical stuff about the, the micro penis and all that, I can't for sure say that that was a thing. All right. Um, there is some historical evidence that points to that being possibly true, um, but we can't verify it. But it's it's kind of fun to think about when I tell you about the rest of this. So we know for a fact, one, Hitler would stay up for a long time and they crash. And we also know that Hitler was really, really controlling. Those are two facts, right? We also know that the Germans were expecting an invasion um, in France. They just didn't know exactly where it would be. And so they had soldiers kind of a few stationed on all of these different beaches. Um, but then they also had reserve units. They had people that they could send in for reinforcements. But Hitler required that he personally sign off on any of these reinforcements. So the way the story goes is D-Day happened, it began, and people, the, the higher ups, the guys in charge were requesting um, reinforcements and nobody wanted to wake Hitler up. And so one of the reasons that D-Day was successful was because reinforcements didn't arrive quickly enough. So if our possible like observations about Hitler's hypospadias, the possible micro penis, if all of that is actually true, one could argue that one of the major reasons that the Allies were successful in D-Day and therefore were successful in beating Germany and in winning World War II is because of Hitler's micropenis. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's quickly move on and stop talking about that. So it's time for another meeting. Obviously, we have all of these battles happening. The United States is involved in the war. It looks like things might come to a close sometime soon. So we got to have a meeting. So we have a meeting called the Yalta Conference. And the big three are going to meet um, just before the war is over. Um, so we've got our boy Stalin from Russia. We've got FDR. You guys remember him from the Great Depression. And we've also got this guy, Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was lovely and he pretty much always looks exactly that concerned. Um, so February of 1945, they're going to meet. And the purpose of this is to determine the terms of peace, to figure out what we were going to make Germany do when we ended the war. Um, now, obviously, the war guilt clause had kind of backfired after World War I, so we don't want anything like that. Their solution is going to be the idea of splitting Germany into four parts, one for each of the allies to run after the war is over. Essentially, their idea is we can't trust Germany on their own anymore. And so the war is actually going to end fairly quickly after that. It's going to be May of 1945, so a few months. Um, 
one of the things that sparks the end of the war is a battle called the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, this is a German counteroffensive to regain control of the European front. Essentially what that means, what counteroffensive means, is we had um, the Allies come, they took over France. That was an offensive. They started with D-Day on the beaches of Normandy. They spread out, they took France back and the Germans were fighting against them. Well, then fighting kind of ceases and it restarts with Germany starting the fight. Because remember the Allies started the fight with D-Day. The Germans start the fight. It's called the counter offensive because they start a fight. When you start a fight, it's an offensive. The counter is because it was in retaliation. It was to try to take back France. This is the largest battle that has ever been fought by the United States Army and the largest battle that happens in World War II. Um, and the Allies do very well, the Germans not so much. As the Russians come in and start to take over Berlin in May of 1945, it was reported that Hitler committed suicide. Um, he actually supposedly killed himself along with his wife, Eva Braun. Funny story um, about that though is a lot of people think he didn't really kill himself. One of the reasons for that is because Hitler insisted that his body be burned beyond all recognition. Um, sounds like a little bit crazy, maybe, you know, slightly crazy town banana pants. Um, but by this point in time, in Hitler's defense, which is a sentence I never thought I'd say, um, in Hitler's defense, by this point in time, he and Stalin had a huge huge rivalry and Hitler thought that one of the things that Stalin would probably do is come in and have Hitler very publicly executed and then kind of display his body um, as a means of being like haha I won and this guy didn't. Um, to be fair that is very in character with something that Stalin might have done. Um, so, so the argument uh, is that he wanted himself so badly burned because he didn't want to be able to be used in any sort of Russian propaganda. Um, but other people say that he wanted to be so badly burned because it wasn't actually his body. Um, there are actually reports in the JFK papers that came out a few years ago um, that the United States had been informed that there was a man, I think in, it was either Venezuela or Argentina. I don't know why I can't remember the difference between those two countries. Um, it was one of those, but there were reports of a man that um, a bunch of, former Germans who had moved there after World War II, people who had been Nazis, um, that there was a man that they referred to as Fuhrer and they gave him the Nazi salute. Um, so a lot of people thought that that could have been Hitler. Um, the CIA got reports of it. Um, so who knows? Maybe he died, maybe he didn't. Um, but once it was reported that Hitler had committed suicide, Germany pretty quickly surrenders. Um, and things go absolutely crazy after that because it's at that point that we figure out exactly what had been going on in terms of the Holocaust. So the Holocaust itself is the attempted annihilation of an entire race of people. Hitler is going to kill millions of Jews just because they're Jewish. Um, now he's not only going to target them, he's also going to target um, people who are um, at the time termed gypsies. Um, he's going to target homosexuals. He will target um, anybody who thinks is an enemy of the state. Um, so lots and lots of people are going to die. Um, about half of the people that he murders, though, are Jews. Um, and just like Hitler's rise to power, a lot of people don't really understand why this, this very targeted, attempted annihilation of a whole race. Um, why, why did the Jews let this happen? Like, why did they go along with it? Why didn't they fight back? Um, and so just like with his progression, his slow progression 
um, as far as power, Hitler moves slowly with the Holocaust and it's going to kind of build. It starts with something called Kristallnacht, so another fun German word, um, which translates into the night of broken glass. I remember that one because crystal is also glass, right? Um, the night of broken glass is a an orchestrated pogrom. So I mentioned what pogroms were before, um, kind of like many Holocausts where a bunch of people are being killed. Um, and so it is Germans going into the streets, killing Jews, trying to kill Jews. They burn down all the synagogues. It's a couple nights, two nights of just massive violence against Jews. And here's the kind of genius part about it. Um, Hitler, he reminds me of, so Harry Potter is one of my very favorite things, you guys. Um, Hitler reminds me a little bit of something that Ollivander says about Voldemort. He says um, that Voldemort did terrible things, yes, but great things great things. They were terrible, they were awful, but they were still great. Um, and that's kind of what Hitler did. He did huge things, huge world changing things. They were terrible, they were awful, they were atrocious, but they were big. And so he starts it with Kristallnacht. He starts it himself. The German government is going to instigate Kristallnacht. Um, they're going to kind of coerce the German people into this pogrom and not let anybody know that they were kind of the ones behind it. And so what he does at the end of it is he says, oh, no, we hate the Jews because they're the reason for all of our problems. But we can't just go around killing them willy nilly. Right. And so we got to protect them. They're still people after all. And so he has a bunch of them arrested and he sends them to these concentration camps. But they're not concentration camps like you're thinking of them. They are preliminary concentration camps that are essentially set up um, a little bit more like, uh, almost more like villages. They're still kind of, they're still definitely labor camps, but they're, they're not as bad as the concentration camps that we're gonna see later. This is, this is where Hitler can be scary smart, you guys. He sends a bunch of these Jewish men to these concentration camps, allows them to write letters back home, um, and he walks a really fine line between something that isn't believable and something that is just terrible enough. The concentration camps aren't great, you guys. They're bad, but they're not so bad that the Jews are like, you know, we'd rather come home and face persecution. A lot of people are going to um, come back from these concentration camps and be like, you know, it really wasn't that bad. I would rather be there than here because here is terrible. The other big thing that he does, though, is they come back. All right. So he uses Kristallnacht as an excuse to send a bunch of Jews to these concentration camps. And then when it's supposedly safe, he brings them back. That shows the German people that concentration camps are fine. The Jews go, they're in concentration camps, and they come back healthy and alive, and even saying that they would kind of rather be there. These are not the concentration camps that he's going to use later on, but if you use the same word for it, and you show everybody that it's okay, they're not going to think too hard about it when you send Jews to concentration camps later on. So one of the things that Hitler is going to use within Germany, especially, um, but also outside of Germany, is something called a ghetto. Um, ghettos were literally walled in. It was little pieces of the city where wall would be built around it or it would be fenced in, and it was used to segregate and confine Jews. Um, these ghettos are kind of like miniature cities. People aren't allowed in or out. Um, and they are used to kind of break the spirit of Jews. Um, there's going to be overcrowding. There's going to be hunger. Um, not quite starvation. 
Um, they're going to be worked really, really hard in fields and stuff like that. And again, this is kind of part of the master plan where one, you're physically weakening the Jews, right? They're working and they're not getting the nutrition that they need. They're in really close quarters. People are dying of disease. And also it's going to make the idea of the concentration camps look really good. People are going to remember back to when it happened after Kristallnacht and they're gonna be like, well, the concentration camps are definitely better than these ghettos. Um, there's also going to be these these guys called the Judenrat. I remember who they are because of rats. That word Judenrat, they were like rats. They were Jewish leaders who were forced to oversee the ghettos. Um, this is classic misdirection, you guys. Um, essentially, what was happening with the Judenrat is Nazis weren't the ones running these ghettos. You had the Judenrat, the the like the guys who were in charge in the Jewish communities, they were the ones in charge of the ghettos, but they didn't really have any real power. They had to do what the Nazis told them. But people see the Judenrat, they see them as rats because they're terrible. They think of them as on the side of the Nazis and they're gonna kind of misplace some of their aggressions on the Judenrat. Um, they have to oversee the ghettos. They also decide who goes to the concentration camps. So the concentration camps are primarily going to be located in an area that we refer to as the bloodlands. Um, the bloodlands are the area in between Germany and Russia. Um, so lots of different countries fall into this, but it's important for you to understand concentration camps weren't in the Germans' backyards, all right? Um, they weren't right there. They weren't seeing them all the time. That's one of the reasons that Germans could allow themselves to be okay with it. They weren't seeing it. They didn't see how terrible things were. And when we don't see things on a daily basis, when we don't see how terrible it is to see people in cages or to see people suffering and dying of starvation or disease, we don't, it's not at the forefront of our minds. We don't think about it, right? So the concentration camps are in the bloodlands. Jews were made into slaves, essentially, and they were worked to death. And that's where you get... Uh, these these pictures are um, of Holocaust, uh, not necessarily survivors. Um, I think the one on the right may be Holocaust survivors. Um, but some were taken during the the war itself, but you can see how skinny they are. They're literally skin and bones. They were fed, but they weren't fed enough, and they weren't they were they were fed well enough to keep them alive, but not not forever. Um, and so they, they were worked to death. Um, there's also this paramilitary Nazi group. They were called the Einsatzgruppen. Um, and they were originally the ones who started, who were responsible for killing Jews outright. Because this concentration camps, this is a kind of passive killing. We're just working them to death. Well, eventually... That's not fast enough. And so instead of rounding up people and putting them in the concentration camps in the bloodlands, um, they would just send the Einsatzgruppen to kill them. Just, you know, line them up in mass graves and shoot them. Um, so Einsatzgruppen, I remember who they are because they have the word group literally in the middle of their name. Um, unforeseen problem, though, it is pretty psychologically damaging to just go and machine gun down men, women, and children who haven't done anything wrong. Um, even if you see them as not really human, it can still kind of take a toll on your psyche. And that's one of the reasons that we're going to see the development of extermination camps. Um, before we talk about that, though, we got to talk about another meeting. This was a German meeting. The Nazis met together um, and at the Wannsee conference, they come up with the um, so-called final solution to the Jewish question. This is when the Holocaust really becomes the Holocaust. This defines what they're going to do with the Jews, and that means they're going to kill all of them, okay? And so that's where we see the, the German extermination camps start to become a thing. They're used almost solely for death. 
Most prisoners who came there were killed within hours of their arrival. Um, and they were predominantly killed in gas chambers. So on the right, you'll see those two pictures. Um, these two pictures are both of gas chambers. This picture is the scratches that were made on the walls of the gas chamber of people struggling trying to get out once they realize what's happening to them. Now, the extermination camps were kind of built to look like concentration camps. And one of the first things that you did when you got to a concentration camp, they would strip you down, um, they would shave your head, and they would put everybody in the shower um, to decontaminate them. And so the gas chambers were often made to look like a shower. Um, some people did get kept alive. Um, so these guys were... Not necessarily Jews. A lot of the time they would be like um, Russians who had been captured or um, people from from enemy countries, sometimes gypsies, things like that. People who were enemies of the state but weren't Jewish. Um, but sometimes Jews as well were made to be workers. Um, they were promised that they would be let to live if they cooperated and they were responsible for burning the bodies. Um, they were responsible for getting any like gold teeth out, things like that. Um, now, they weren't actually kept alive. They were usually killed within a few weeks. Um, one major exception, though, to the extermination camps is this camp. This is Auschwitz. Auschwitz was the only combination extermination death camp. Um, and so a lot of our preconceived notions, a lot of the things that we think we know about um, Holocaust survivors come from Auschwitz. Um, for example, um, a lot of people think that all Jews who were in a concentration camp or an extermination camp were tattooed on their arm with a number. That was actually something that was exclusively done at Auschwitz. Um, the reason that we have a tendency to think that all Holocaust survivors have those tattoos is because by the time we get to the end of World War II, most people, most Jews have been moved from concentration camps to extermination camps. And so most Jews that were captured have already been killed. All right, so there's a video down here that I want you guys to watch for me, please. Um, and this is is all about the Holocaust. Um, millions, like I said, millions. I think it's upwards of 12 to 15 million is our estimate at this point. Millions of people were murdered at the hands of the Nazis, um, all for an ideology that was based on the concept that one race was fundamentally better than another. Because a lot of, things, a lot of the time we think of Jewish as being a religion. Um, Jewish is also a race. And the people who were put in concentration camps, who were put in extermination camps, who were murdered during the Holocaust, they weren't just practicing religious Jews. They were people who had a Jewish heritage, uh, people who had converted to Christianity, who didn't practice Judaism whatsoever, who never had. Um, so this is, it's important for you to understand, this was a very race-based Holocaust. I didn't want to leave you with just sad things about the Holocaust, though. Um, there are a lot of survivors. I wanted to give you guys um, some of the happy pictures, some of the pictures from the Russians coming in and liberating um, people who had been trapped in these concentration camps or in the ghettos. So there is a happy ending for a lot of people. I know the Holocaust is a really, really rough time period to talk about, but it's also really important because it it's one of those things that if we don't remember it, it might happen again. And 
you guys need to understand what an atrocity this was. And you need to understand that it wasn't something that happened overnight. It wasn't something that all of the Germans were gung-ho about it. It wasn't everybody coming together and saying, let's murder all of these people. There were people saying, hey, maybe let's not kill the Jews. But people weren't being given the whole story. One guy had way too much power. Um, and it snowballed. And millions of people were dead as a result. All right, so let's switch gears and talk about the war in the Pacific. Um, now, there are several major battles um, in the Pacific. Um, Pearl Harbor is the one that most of us know, December 7th, 1941. That is literally the only date that I was ever required to memorize um, when I was getting my bachelor's degree. Because um, I've told you guys before, history isn't about the names and dates. It's about the analysis. It's about understanding what happens. But I did have to memorize that one. So I'll probably never forget it. Um, another really big thing to understand, though, about Pearl Harbor is it didn't happen in a vacuum. It wasn't something that happened out of nowhere and it was just Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor was where the United States had moved most of our naval fleet because we were not happy with the Japanese. Um, we didn't like some of their tactics. We didn't like the, what they were doing. Um, there's something that happened um, we don't really have time to go into. It's called the Rape of Nanking, if you ever want to look that up. Um, it was awful. It was absolutely horrible. Um, it's really important for you guys to understand Hitler was doing some terrible things, but he was not the only guy doing terrible things. We did some awful stuff. The Japanese did some pretty, pretty bad stuff. That was one of the really bad things that they did. Um, but so we didn't agree with a lot of the stuff that they were doing. Um, we were worried about our land holdings, especially the Philippines that was really close to them. Um, and so we move our naval fleet as close to Japan as we can get while still remaining technically within the United States. And that's Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Well, supposedly the Japanese were going to come and they were going to talk to us about what we could do, what we could all do to prevent war. While those talks are occurring, they bombed Pearl Harbor, but they also bombed other places. They bombed a bunch of British land holdings, and they also um, bombed places in the Philippines where we had uh, a lot of our military. Um, and so after that happens, uh, there's going to be the battle for the Philippines. Um, and that has to do specifically with something called the Bataan Death March. Um, once the Philippines are kind of lost, once the Americans give up, the Americans and a, a lot of Filipinos that are fighting with them, um, they give up because they're pushed to a peninsula called the Bataan Peninsula. Um, the guy in charge, General MacArthur, is actually able to get away. He gets away to Australia. Um, but a bunch of people are left stranded there and they're taken as prisoners of war. By the Japanese. Um, the Japanese are going to force them along a 65 mile march to prison camps. Um, the guys at the end of this, um, there, there are American soldiers who are in these prison camps, these Japanese prison camps for the rest of the war. Um, and they come out looking a lot like Holocaust survivors. They are not treated well. They're not treated like you're supposed to treat a prisoner of war, which is kind of a recurring theme throughout history. Um, there are ways that you're supposed to treat prisoners of war, and then there's a way that they're actually treated. Um, like if you guys um, know anything about uh, Andersonville, it's fairly close to us, the Andersonville uh, prisoner of war camp, um, lots of atrocities like that. Um, it happened in Vietnam as well, um, and we might have time to talk about that later on in the quarter. We might not. I don't know if we'll get there, but um, there are also a few major battles. So we start out losing um, Pearl Harbor, the Bataan Death March. Things aren't going well. Then we're going to have um, the Battle of Coral Sea. This is actually the first carrier battle in world history. Um, so a carrier is an aircraft carrier. So... You put your planes on the aircraft carrier, they can take off and they can land um, 
on this aircraft carrier. And so this is a battle that takes place entirely in the air um, with the carriers not even being able to see each other, but nobody is anywhere near land. Um, so that's a huge thing. And that's primarily how we're gonna see the fighting in the Pacific happen. Um, the Battle of Midway is going to be, Midway is a place, but it's also perfectly named because it's a turning point in the Pacific uh, because we destroy a bunch of the Japanese carriers and Japan wasn't quite as industrialized as the United States. Um, so we could make carriers a lot quickly, a lot more quickly than they could quicker. Yeah, quicker. I don't know why I couldn't get that word out. Um, but so since we can make them quicker um, and we destroyed, I think like five out of seven of theirs, um, Midway was where we stopped being just on the defensive and we started being able to go on the offensive. Um, so then we've got three major battles after that, Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. All of these are going to be based on a war plan called War Plan Orange. Um, that's the name of our strategy, uh, which is island hopping to get bombers in rage of Japan. So we have something during this period called an air umbrella. All right. At this point in time, we cannot circumnavigate the globe without our... Uh, planes having to refuel. We can't just take off and go all the way around the world. It's not a thing. We can only go so far. That is our air umbrella, how far we can go without needing to refuel. And so the idea of War Plan Orange is that we literally just kind of like leapfrog from place to place. We take it over and then eventually we should be able to reach Japan. That's the idea. So throughout all of this, um, we're trying to reach Japan. We're talking in code to make sure that when the Japanese intercept our messages, they can't understand what we're talking about, right? Um, and so that's where Native Americans are going to become hugely important. All right, so we've treated them terribly. Remember, we talked about the closing of the Western frontier, go stance movement, you guys remember all that stuff. Well, now we're going to use the fact that we didn't let Native Americans speak their language with the Dawes Severalty Act for years and years and years. Um, we've literally made their language die out, uh, specifically the Navajo. Um, there were so few people in the world that spoke the Navajo language by the time we get to World War II, that we were able to use it as a code. Um, so the Navajo wind talkers fight, um, they're primarily Marines, um, and they literally just spoke their language to one another, um, but nobody outside of the few Navajo who remained could ever understand what they were saying. So it was the perfect code, it was unbreakable. You can break any code. You guys remember the Zimmerman note from World War I? The code was broken and um, the British passed off the, the telegram to us, to the United States. Well, you, you can break any code that you know the base language, if given enough time and if you're smart enough. If you don't know the language that it's based on though, there's no way to break it. That's why the Navajo wind talkers were so important. They were especially important in Guadalcanal. All right, so this is a video for you guys to watch about the wind talkers. Go ahead and do that later on. Um, you'll see a code talker uh, who is adorable um, explain the Navajo role in World War II. Another thing that you guys need to understand um, about Japan, specifically about the war in the Pacific, is how difficult it was to get the Japanese to surrender. Um, they actually relied on something called the Bushido Code. Um, this is part of the Samurai Code. Um, it was from way, 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 way back in the day. Um, from something called the Shogunate. 
Um, but the Bushido Code was all about the idea that death in battle was preferable to surrender. Um, so you'll see, especially in battles like Iwo Jima, um, so many more people would have to fight in order to take out the Japanese or get them to surrender. Um, cause the, the idea of physically fighting of war of battle is not just to indiscriminately murder people, right? It's not to go massacre people. It's to fight until one guy backs down and you want to be the guy that wins. Um, in order to win battles though, we had to send in so many more people because these guys wouldn't just surrender. They would rather die in battle. Um, and they would do that even past the point of the logical point where you can't win anymore. Uh, so that's going to be hugely important when we talk about the dropping of the atomic bomb and whether or not that was an okay thing to do to Japan. Um, they also are going to use kamikazes. Um, kamikazes were suicide pilots, um, and they would crash their bomb-laden planes into Allied ships. These guys were first used in the Battle of the Philippines, and that kind of shows you the Bushido Code mentality. And so that brings us to the dropping of the atomic bomb. Now, the atomic bomb was developed by these guys, by something called the Manhattan Project, specifically a guy that ran it was called J. Robert Oppenheimer. Um, and the idea behind dropping the atomic bomb was that it would ultimately cause less casualties than trying to actually take over Japan. We dropped two bombs on them. First, we drop one on Hiroshima and then on Nagasaki. Now, I'm not going to go too far in depth about the Manhattan Project and the dropping of the atomic bombs here because you guys are actually going to talk about that in your assignment for this week and argue whether or not the bomb should have been dropped. I also want to talk a little bit about how minorities were treated um, during World War II. Um, women... Japanese Americans and African Americans were all treated pretty horribly. Um, there was lots of gender discrimination going on. Um, women probably had it the best out of all these guys. Um, African Americans are going to use something called the double V campaign. This is the idea of the victory against fascism abroad and racism at home, um, which, which basically meant for African Americans, the idea was they go, they fight, in um, World War II, and then they would hopefully get equality at home. That unfortunately does not happen for them. Japanese Americans, though, they have it pretty bad. Um, we think about concentration camps, we don't think about America, right? We think about Germany. Um, but Japanese Americans were put in camps called internment camps with Executive Order 9066. It was signed by Franklin D. Roosevelt, and we actually put Japanese Americans, people who were American citizens, into these camps. Um, if you've ever heard of George Takei, um, he's pretty famous, Star Trek. Um, he actually was in an internment camp as a child. Um, he spoke in pretty prolifically about it. So this is just an example comparison for you guys um, of what the concentration camps in Germany and the internment camps in the United States look like. I want you guys to understand, we talk about concentration camps. Um, we hear a lot less about internment camps because it's something that we did, but it's something that you need to know that we did. Um, it's something that was very shameful that we did and something that was very similar to what Hitler was doing at the same time. If we condemn one, we need to understand that we did it as well. Now, another big thing that's going on during this period of time is, again, the use of propaganda. Um, specifically, we are going to create the Office of War Information to spread information about the enemy. Um, there's the idea of public sacrifice, where you ration, you work in the war effort, things like that. Um, so like, for example, Uncle Sam here, wanting us for the US Army. So these last few slides are just a few examples of American propaganda. I especially want you guys to watch the video on the last slide. Um, it's one of my favorites. It 
is a Donald Duck cartoon that is used as anti-Nazi propaganda. Um, so take some time. I'm going to flip through them real quick in the video, um, but take some time to look at the PowerPoint as well.